This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, my 20th year on faculty, and I still feel so happy and humbled to be able to work with all you smart people. Um, I'm going to try to be smart, and if I can't be, I'm going to try to be at least entertaining. So hopefully one or the other will work. Um, I've got a lot of slides to get through, so I'm just going to talk a little fast, um, but hopefully there'll be time at um, the end to also have a discussion. So I took the uh, mandate for disclosures rather broadly. Um, I'm going to be providing you um, the best of what we know from that evidence. Um, I don't have any personal financial relationships related to the topics discussed today. I um, am not as smart as some of my colleagues who can talk about neurophysiology, so hopefully you won't ask me any of those questions. Um, but I have other areas I'm smarter in. And I do have a mischievous sense of humor. So, you know, if um, you wonder if I'm um, being uh, serious or not, I'm probably joking, as most of you who know me know. Um, the topic of today is pediatric iatrogenic medical trauma. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, but just to set the stage, this is a set of both psychological and physiological responses of children and their family to a variety of potentially traumatizing um, situations. Before I go through this talk, I really want to um, encourage you to think about your frame of reference. You know, we usually are sitting in these grand rounds as clinicians thinking about what we might be able to learn um, to apply to our practice. Um, today, what I'd like you to do, if you want to play with me, is to really remember what it was like to be seven years old. Think about what you can remember of what you thought of yourself, others, how scared you were when it was time to go to the doctor, um, how you processed information. See if you can keep that frame of reference as much as you can during this talk. So we're switching it around a little bit. So before I kind of go through this, I want to convince you that this is an important topic. Um, first off, I think it's an important topic because the kids that we care for are exposed to a lot of potentially traumatizing situations. Um, especially when they're in the hospital, there's a lot of scary things that are going on. Sometimes they're separated from their parents. They're meeting all sorts of people that they don't know. There's a lots of scary equipment. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. He's used to me. Um, and, you know, people who uh, they have to meet on a daily basis. So what a percentage of your inpatients do you think develop trauma symptoms? What would you guess? E. E? Anybody else? I can't really see you very well, so I'm not going to know if you said the wrong number. All right, 25 to 34% of your patients develop trauma symptoms. Um, research reveals that that's pretty consistent across settings, and in case you think perhaps we're better here, um, you'll see in the yellow down here that even research done here with our own folks shows that we're right at the higher end of that um, among our transplant patients. So we're right in there with other locations. Um, and just to be clear, post-traumatic stress symptoms is off what I'm going to be talking a lot about today. Um, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. And to meet criteria for the disorder requires you know, a bunch of criteria to be met. But what we found research-wise is that the old criteria were really meant to be applied to adults. And so they didn't map on that well to children. And the research revealed that a lot of kids who had many post-traumatic stress symptoms were just as disabled and distressed as people who met full criteria. 
So now in the DSM-5, we're trying to address that a bit better, um, but nevertheless, whether or not they're meeting full criteria is less important in terms of the need to treat and address the problem than um, it might be in some other disorders. Number three, the traumatic experiences are not just a temporary psychological event. They can actually evoke biological responses that can permanently alter brain structure and the developmental trajectory of a child. It can lead to memory issues, emotional regulation problems, behavioral regulation problems, and behavioral dis developmental disruptions either direction, either somebody being much more regressed in their behaviors and their development, or becoming much more risk-taking and um, um, it, um, uh, I guess it's the, that's what I want to say, just risk-taking as they, as they develop. There's probably another part of that I forget. Okay, so number four, parents are at even higher risk for post-traumatic stress symptoms due to their children's medical experiences. And this is really, really important because parents are some of the most important buffering systems and um, support that they have when they're in the hospital and outside of the hospital. So if the parents are not um, able to appropriately care for their child, the child is missing out on a very important um, buffering uh, structure. Close to 84% of parents after an ICU stay experience post-traumatic stress symptoms. And at nine months of the, parent, of the parents who met full criteria for PTSD, 10% still did. And finally, this is um, post-traumatic stress symptoms are one of the leading causes of our medical non-adherence. And so, as you all know, this is a huge problem and um, also can develop into psychiatric disorders, in re increased risky behaviors, and other kinds of problems that can then impact health and lead to early death. Many times when we get called on kids who are being you know, resistant, not getting in the car to go into the doctor, refusing to take medication, being aggressive towards staff, when we really get in and evaluate, we find out that the reason is because a lot of these things are serving as trauma triggers and it's too distressing for the kids to face. So they act out in these ways to avoid it. So for those of you unfamiliar with the ACEs pyramid, this is kind of how it's um, visually depicted. So the bottom line is that up to 30% of your patients could be more impacted over the long run by their traumatic medical experiences than by their underlying medical problem. And that addressing this can be just as important or more important for health and quality of life as getting a new organ. So, you know, it's, um, it seems at times perhaps like a, something that you just set aside so that you can get through the medical procedure and then deal with it later. But what I want to argue today is that the earlier we can intervene and the quicker that we can start providing appropriate care when we see signs of trauma, um, we can avoid a lot of unnecessary medical care and um, comorbidity. So the objectives for today are to just um, learn to identify some of the early signs and symptoms of iatrogenic medical trauma, identify ways to reduce that risk, and also become aware of resources that are available to you to help you. Um, I have way too many slides, so we'll see. I talk pretty fast, but if for some reason I don't get through them all, much of what I'm saying is um, in a paper that my colleague uh, Marcy Forgey and I wrote um, that's available on PubMed. So. Okay, so for the DSM-5, um, I just wanted to show you what criteria A is. So everybody has to meet this criteria as the first step um, when you're evaluating for PTSD. And um, the reason I'm showing it to you is to show you that you can either directly experience a traumatic event that you think could result in um, a very serious um, medical event for you, either death or something very disfiguring, um, or you can witness it and still be equally traumatized, or learn that somebody you care about has gone through something like this, or be repeatedly exposed to such aversive details on a daily basis, like many of us are and almost all of our nursing staff is. And so you can expect not only that your, um, some of your patients will have trauma symptoms, most of your parents might have trauma symptoms, but many of you may as well um, as your colleagues. Um, so it's something to think about for yourselves as well. So, you know, one of the ways we've coped with it over time is we've said, okay, well, if we sedate enough, you know, maybe we'll be able to mitigate 
um, against this. And there's a degree to which that's true, but um, it's not quite as clear cut as it would initially seem. Um, some of you might be familiar with this study done by Colville, um, looking at um, factual and delusional memories in the intensive care unit. And they interviewed uh, seven to 17 year olds um, three months after they were in the ICU. This was not done at UCLA. Um, and about uh, two thirds of them reported that they remembered you know, things that happened factually. And about a third reported delusional memories or hallucinations. So they were um, delirious for a reason, some reason or another. Who do you think would be higher risk for trauma symptoms? The clown is a little bit of a hint. Yeah, um, people who had delusional memories were much more likely to be traumatized. And that makes sense when you look at that clown. It's kind of scary. And that's controlling for illness severity and the emergency status and all of that. Factual memories, memory, remembering the scary stuff wasn't placing the kids at high risk. It was remembering it in a very distorted way that added to the risk. And what um, contributes to those delusional memories? Opiates and benzodiazepines were the things that were most commonly associated. So it gets a little confusing because on the one hand, um, opiates can be also very protective because pain is one of the um, big contributors to trauma symptoms, but um, both benzos and opiates also can increase the likelihood of delirium. Again, just to remind you how scary that is, think of being a child, being that seven-year-old, and looking up and seeing something like this. Okay, what about the babies? Is stress, trauma, and pain less of a long-term problem for babies? We know that conscious memory of an early painful event is not necessary to, for adverse outcomes. In fact, preterm babies are at even higher risk um, because um, they're not as developed in their neurology. So the descending neural pathways are not well developed and so they don't um, inhibit nociception as well. So they might actually be much more sensitive to pain. And we do know um, that undertreated pain causes increased pain sensitivity later, much later, um, as well as decreased immune functioning, avoidance, and social hypervigilance. So even without having a verbal memory of what happened, or even you know, any um, conscious memory, this can impact you over your lifetime. So we know that um, even having frequent kneels and um, uh, heel sticks as, a, as an infant can result in much more reactivity later when you're getting your five-year-old immunizations. So switching to clinical assessment of trauma. Um, I picked this uh, picture just to kind of remind me to say that as you know, um, Sometimes the white coat is enough, right? How do you know? You know, what's your first clue when you walk into a room that perhaps you have a child who's medically traumatized? When you walk in the room and they see your white coat and they immediately start telling you to get out and no, 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 you're hurting me, you're hurting me. You know, that right there is um, reason to uh, suspect that there's probably already a post-traumatic stress um, syndrome of some sort going on. Um, behavioral observations are usually the first tip. Um, you know, you can do clinical interviewing, there's questionnaires, drawing, playing, storytelling, there's a lot of ways to get at it. But from your perspective, it'll probably be behavioral inter um, observations and also uh, reports from the parent. So in terms of um, the different symptom clusters, um, there's three main ones that most people talk about and that reflects the DSM. The first one is re-experiencing of the symptoms. So it's feeling like it's happening again. And this is one reason why sometimes it's, you walk in the room and the, the child might be saying, you're hurting me, you're hurting me, when clearly you're not. Um, because just that white coat or seeing you can be enough to prompt that re-experience or the emotional response um, to the um, previous experience. Um, you might see really anxious, repetitive play um, focused on the trauma itself, and that will be a clue for you. Some kids have nightmares. It may or may not be about the medical event itself. Um, it could just be vague nightmares. Um, they might have strong uh, trauma responses to pills, to 
anything related to their illness, including talking about it. Um, we don't see flashbacks too much in young kids, but they can occur where they really feel like it's actually going on again. Um, but dissociative episodes, I wanted to just comment on, um, we don't see it too often. Uh, we saw it recently. Um, and it's really hard to, I mean, it's really easy to miss those because the dissociative kids are usually not screaming. So it's the kid that's kind of almost too compliant with painful procedures. And during the procedure, they seem to be off and gone. And it makes it easy for you because they're not being reactive. But if you notice they're not really attending that much to what's going on, um, you might want to wonder a little bit, are they dissociating? The next symptom cl um, cluster is avoidance and numbing. And this is um, a really important one as well. So um, these are a lot of the kids who are uh, non-compliant. And it's really a desperate effort to save their lives from their perspective by avoidance. And so even though they're very frustrating to us because they're being non-compliant, you have to understand that to them it's a life and death matter. And you know, when you see a child who's normally social really withdraw, I've seen them even curled up into a little ball and not reacting to anybody, that's a particularly um, important red flag because as you know, astonishingly, most of our kids are able to play and be social despite all of the medical things they're going through. And when that disappears, that's a whole other level of um, concern that you should have. I don't know I need to even talk about this because I think the face says it all. Um, the third symptom cluster and the one that we most likely are able to immediately identify is hyperarousal. Um, and this is the one that um, parents will tell you about and it's usually often some of the first symptoms that you will see. You need to then also think about um, the things that impact that trauma trajectory. If you have a child coming into the hospital for a pretty intensive medical course and you know already that they have a history of a different type of trauma, um, you can be assured that they're very high risk for additionally acquiring medical trauma. And it's probably a good idea to plan from the future to try to mitigate their risk. Um, kids who have fewer co adaptive coping um, skills available to them, who've had a history of pain or currently are experiencing uncontrolled pain, um, who don't have the benefit of a strong support system in terms of their families, um, who've had deaths of siblings or family members, as we know with some of our genetic disorders, we've had really you know, some tragic situations with some of our families with multiple family members impacted. So all of these things place somebody at higher risk and really um, calls for a little thought to be preventative. Protective factors are also really important. Um, those kids who do have a strong um, and varied repertoire of coping skills do far better. And you kind of know that. You can kind of tell when a child is first admitted to the hospital or you meet them for the first time in clinic. You kind of get a sense of this sometimes. Um, and those who have a higher self-esteem and feel more self-efficacious, who can talk to you directly and ask for what they want, those kids tend to do better over time. Extrinsic uh, protective factors really are centered around the family system, um, having a secure attachment to their primary health, um, parent caregiver, um, and that caregiver really being skilled as a parent in their um, parenting skills and also psychological functioning themselves and a close-knit family. All of those things are helpful. Um, these protective factors give us a lot of really helpful information in terms of intervention because we know based on this that if we have interventions that are very skilled focused and family centered that we're going to really do the best we can to equip children to be more resilient um, through these medical endeavors. So I'm going to segue a little bit to prevention. Um, many of you are familiar with STAR Clinic. We've got the clinical director sitting here, wave, Catherine. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody else from STARS here, forgive me if you are, I can't see too well. Um, the Stress Trauma and Resilience Clinic um, is within the Department of Psychiatry. Um, we feed a lot of um, pediatric patients into that clinic, either after they've had trauma symptoms, but what you might not know is they actually will do preventative resiliency training as well. And um, so if you have a child who's like listed for an 
Oregon or you know there's you know some rough times ahead and you're kind of worried about their capacity for coping with it you, one thing you can think about is having them gain some training and having their family gain some training um, through the star clinic and I'll talk a teeny bit about that um, some more at the end hopefully Second of all, we know that um, pain is a very strong um, contributor to trauma symptoms. So aggressive pain management is really an important feature. You know, you, I know that people have been asking me, why does your service hate benzos so much? And it's not that we hate benzos, it's that we know that if we have a choice, um, picking the opiate for trauma prevention is gonna be much more effective. And I'm gonna talk more about the reason why benzos not so much later. Um, but this is something that you can do that makes a big difference. Identifying and treating frightening delirium-associated hallucinations and delusions is an incredibly important thing to do. Again, remember, you're seven years old, and you know, you see this. And these are the kind of images that people see when they're in that state. It's extremely frightening, and so um, not surprising that it can be very traumatizing. You've all heard the communication tips um, in various settings, I'm sure, providing kids with developmentally appropriate communication at their um, level at a pace set by them, giving them choices that are realistic if they want them, listening for their understanding of what's going on, correcting misconceptions, providing realistic hope, um, encouraging them to use coping techniques, encouraging the parents to. Um, interestingly, while we're all aware of these things, it really gets slipped, um, put along the um, sidelines when you're busy. And um, I think it's hard to remember that even the little things that you're doing are really important. Um, and so when you're walking in the room and you know you're not gonna do anything painful and you know you're not gonna do anything that um, is gonna be too traumatizing, you're just gonna maybe look at a wound, but that's it. The child doesn't know that. And so um, even though it seems like a little thing, adjusting one of the um, machines, it's really important to say what you're, gonna, what you're doing, whether or not you're gonna be touching the child, whether or not it's gonna hurt or not. All of that information for most kids, um, occasionally there's a child that doesn't wanna know that information, but overwhelmingly they do. And even if it's a little thing, it makes a big difference because they're trying to sort out and figure out if you're dangerous or not in that moment. Um, and it, even though it might take a few minutes to do this at times, you know what it's like to be trying to work with a child who's already really dysregulated and traumatized. And so that time you put in here saves a lot of time and potentially a lot of healthcare dollars here too if you're able to change that trajectory um, of trauma symptoms. There's a lot we can do with our parents to teach them to help their child to recognize um, that um, sometimes regressive behaviors are a sign of distress. It's not just necessarily them acting out. Um, you know, parents often want to know, what can I do? I feel very helpless. And even though it seems very simple to say, you know, can you provide, can you be here? Can you provide comfort? Can you um, be non-reactive so that your child is not um, looking to you and seeing that they should be panicking because you're panicking? Are you able to provide a routine that some, is somewhat reassuring because they're used to it from home? Um, when the parent can't be there, can they bring things from home to remind them and that, that home exists? You know, all of these things that we know can be helpful, um, we don't necessarily think to remind parents of, but can be very reassuring and calming to parents, which then is very calming to the children, and then if they're able to do any of these things, then that is helpful as well. Um, we have a lot of handouts that it's very easy to just hand to the parent. I'm going to get to those. Um, you know, the psychosocial staff, all of everybody is often helpful in that regard as well. So um, especially with the higher risk kids, I think it's important to make sure all these players are in place. Equally important, what's unhelpful? Over pathologizing or laughing at somebody as they're trying to cope with something. Now this sounds like, well, who would laugh 
let me tell you, when I was looking on the internet at um, videos, I have a video to show you in a little while, almost every single video I looked at, people were laughing at the poor kid trying to cope. Um, and it, you know, they're funny, I, I understand that, maybe it's the funny ones to get on the internet, but um, it's really um, important to realize that even if a child is sedated and acting funny, they're trying to cope and process the information around them. And to have um, the people around them acting differently than they normally act can add to the um, trauma. So, you know, telling somebody, you're acting crazy, snap out of it, is not necessarily helpful in the moment. Um, we used to debrief people after a trauma. You know, you need to talk about it. You need to talk about it as soon as possible, get as much detail out. What we realize now is that it can interrupt with the natural recovery process. It can heighten the emotional experience um, and heighten the, emotional ac the access to emotional memory and um, is really not as helpful. It's more helpful to be supportive, help with some basic problem solving. If someone wants to talk about it, that's fine, but you're, you know, we're no longer trying to get people to talk about it. And then, you know, we feel helpless. We see somebody extremely distressed, and we want to make them feel better. That's what we do. We're caregivers. And so it's really um, a strong pull to try to help them with medications because that's our, you know, one of our main tools. And so to provide a sleep agent or a benzodiazepine, you know, right away to help somebody seems like a very kind thing to do. But again, it can interrupt the natural recovery from a trauma experience and interfere with the integration of all the sensory information that's present. It selectively um, provides better access to the emotional content and less access to the con context of the event so that it makes it much higher risk that it'll be traumatizing. Nurse Ratchet has up there to remind us that the delivery is also important. You know, if you say the exact right thing in not the right tone, um, it can be sometimes not helpful either. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, ad addressing that hyperarousal is important, but immediately medicating it can be problematic. We are now learning something we didn't know before, and that's that if you're using the benzos during an acute trauma, which means during a procedure, you can actually exacerbate trauma symptoms. Now, the kid might look relaxed, so it makes it easier to do the procedure, which is you know, an important thing, but again, because um, it interferes with the GABA system, it interferes with the normal recovery and integration of that memory. And that's why we're often recommending, especially with already traumatized kids or kids who don't like the feeling of a benzo, that this can be a problem. Um, now, you know, the, one of the easiest ways for me to think about it is that, you know, probably a, a few of you in the audience have had a martini before, and you probably like the feeling. You know, it's kind of relaxing. It's been, a, you've done it in a social setting, you know, you know that feeling. But if you're seven years old and you drink a martini, Probably that's the first time you've ever had one. It's very unsettling. You feel really loopy and it's very confusing. So you've got all of that going on. At the same time, someone's coming at you with a big needle and your parents are laughing at you because you're acting crazy. That is a really bizarre experience and it's kind of like seeing the clown. Um, it's a very hard thing to integrate. We also have other problems um, with benzos at times. Now, it doesn't mean we're always against them either. We know that their older adolescents um, sometimes are much more um, able to um, use the anxiolytic properties of the benzo without having an agitated or a paradoxical response. Um, sometimes they're less disturbed by the feeling associated with it. Um, there are some younger kids that it doesn't seem to bother, especially if they don't have a trauma history. So, you know, obviously for nausea, for seizures, for air hunger, for, you know, there's times when it's very helpful. But when you're talking about traumatized kids and you're talking about procedures, really put thought into um, what agents you're using, and we're happy to help if needed. So I'm going to give you a little example. Um, I looked on the internet at tons of these, um, and some of you may have seen this before, but I think it's a good example of what I'm talking about. Hey, kids, what's up? How'd it go, Matt? It went good. Your arm feel bad. <laughs> it feels good. Good. You know? I know. Yeah. So it wasn't 
wasn't so bad going to sleep, was it? Is it? No. Going to sleep's awesome. Yes. Oh, good. I feel dizzy. Do <laughs> Why do I feel dizzy? <laughs> the mess. Dizzy. The stupid dizzy. So what went well in that one? What did you like about that? <coughs> I know, it's early. It's yeah, he didn't seem too anxious, at least in the beginning, yeah. He was a little disturbed when he saw the big orange, when he saw the big orange thing and two grandmas, but before that he was kind of having fun. He wasn't in pain. He wasn't in pain, that's right. That's a good one, yeah. I guess he has more. Yeah. And, and the grandma said, explained why she, he was seeing double, said it's because of the medicine, so that was good. Right? Anything else good? He doesn't seem scared. Yeah. What did you not like about how that transpired? Pardon me? <laughs> Yeah, they were, they were laughing at him, right? He was asking about what was on his arm and nobody was providing him information. They were just kind of laughing at him. And you know, it's funny because I went through so many of these videos looking for one today and every single one, that's what was happening. You know, the parents were laughing at the kid. Um, and you know, sometimes it was probably a benign thing, but it can change into a scary situation very quickly. And so I just wanted to, um, highlight that for you. Um, okay, so what can a parent do in that situation? This is not any kind of evidence-based anything I found. This is a site like Googled how to help somebody having a bad trip. I was like, what would it say? I'm like, oh, that kind of works pretty good. So, you know, I think these things apply, you know, just kind of helping with orientation like you would with someone who's delirious, you know, explaining, this is just the medicine, I'm here with you, it's gonna end. Um, don't make it worse by having them do some complex things so you can laugh at them, like button their you know, sweater or asking them questions they can't answer, which is what I saw in a lot of the videos. Um, laughing at them can be really isolating and even though um, a child might not say it, um, is something that can really kind of make them feel bad. Like, should I be, you know, maybe not in the moment, but later. Um, and, you know, I also saw in some of these videos kids trying to go back to sleep. They're sedated and they're tired, but they're so funny that their parents are like trying to wake them up so they can still, you know, play with them some more because they're being so funny. So just kind of giving them the space they need to recover and doing kind of soothing activities um, is probably a better idea. Um, I know I'm repeating myself now, but opiates for pain control while monitoring for delirium is one of the best things you can do. We know that, you know, length of time and dosing of opiates is one of the contributors to delirium, but if we're able to catch that quickly, the pain control is worth um, that risk for sure. 
Um, we opt, as you know, for um, antipsychotics for either um, low doses for either hyperactive or hypoactive delirium. You're used to seeing the hyperactive type usually because that's the agitated type where people are hallucinating and um, it's really ob much more obvious usually. But there's also hypoactive delirium where maybe the child's become mute or less responsive. Um, has significant attentional, um, attentional impairment. Um, and so you might not pick up on that quite as much, um, but that's equally important. Um, when we already have trauma symptoms, uh, those of you who've worked with our service know that um, we usually are trying to address that with um, SSRIs or again, a low dose of an antipsychotic for severe symptoms. And those, and, and those medications are not as, um, altering of your sense of reality. So they're less contributory to the symptoms over time. Um, again, you have a lot of resources here that you already know about, I won't get into. Um, but you might not be aware of some of the resources on the internet, even on our own website. Um, the Child Life Program has lots of handouts that are very good to give to parents, and I encourage you to use those as much as you can um, to give parents direction on how they can be helpful. Um, also, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has a whole toolkit for healthcare providers on pediatric medical traumatic stress, and along with handouts for parents as well. So if you're unfamiliar with that uh, website, I highly recommend that you look at it. Um, you can see some of the examples of what they have on this website here. Um, and just to prove to you I'm not making this stuff up, it's actually, you know, the traumatic stress network actually says and here's an example of a handout for a parent. I know I'm going fast. Um, I'm not thinking you're going to be reading all of this, but just to give you an idea. So then, um, so we've done identification, some prevention, things you can do to mitigate. And then the next part is, you know, when do you refer to a trauma specialist? You know, the, a lot of the folks in our hospitals and a lot of our outpatients will be traumatized, but it doesn't mean that they all need to get trauma treatment. Um, most people who are traumatized at a mild level will experience resolution of those trauma symptoms. And what I'll usually say to families in the hospital is that, you know, you educate them about what those trauma symptoms are and how common they are but that what you really want to do is start watching. And over time, you know, it sounds kind of silly, it's like a head injury, it'll get better or it'll get worse. You know, so if over time you're seeing it get better, 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 you know, it's a natural recovery. We don't have to really necessarily intervene, um, but using a lot of those skills I talked about earlier can be helpful. All right, that I will talk about in a minute. Um, if it gets worse or stays the same, then the chances are um, that you're gonna, that treatment will be needed to resolve the situation. Um, and one study um, that we were involved here with here at UCLA, um, looking at cancer survivors, um, it was found that many years later, 9% still met criteria for PTSD and another 23% uh, had trauma symptoms. So that's a pretty good chunk, um, many years after the end of treatment. Um, so it's in these situations that really um, referring to an evidence-based trauma-focused treatment is um, a very important thing to do. This uh, gets back to the STAR clinic a little bit, the, the um, signs over here. That's just one potential resource for you, but I like the images. Um, Psychoeducation is always an important part of this. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment has a good evidence base for it. Um, usually what's involved in that kind of treatment is teaching the family skills such as emotion regulation skills, problem solving, family communication. Um, goal setting, those kinds of things. They also um, do a time map of what the family's been through. And it's very interesting because what they learn this way is that you know the, each family member experiences the trauma in different ways and, and copes with it in different ways. And because of that, that interferes with the way that um, they're able to communicate about it. And so if each person does their own time map, 
you know, of what happened and what was the worst part and, you know, what did they think what was going on at the time. And then the family members come back and compare those experiences. That allows them to not only identify that for that, you know, the other family members' experiences were and what was hard about it for them, but it also increases uh, their empathy for each other and communication about what happened and basically reinforces the protective nature of the family unit and helps them cope better with what's going on. Um, so that's one example of um, intervention that gets done in that clinic and you know, perhaps other places as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be STAR clinic that you could um, refer to, but I would encourage you that not all therapy is equal. There are people who are trauma specialists and that's really what you want in this situation. Um, also, you know, Treating comorbidities is important. So if we have a child who has, um, you know, a predisposed or a, um, a premorbid generalized anxiety disorder or separation anxiety or some other um, or depression or some other thing, that has to be treated as well in order to make a good recovery from the PTSD. Um, I wanted just to mention image rehearsal therapy. There's not an evidence base for kids in this. This is in adults. It's a pretty robust um, intervention in adults, and we've recently um, been uh, using it with some kids. And it's been really fun and really effective. Um, so if you have uh, kids that are having really disturbing nightmares, um, what we do is work with them on developing a story where they change the ending of the nightmare and they go through it over and over again and it ends up impacting their experience of their dreams. And we've done this in um, the hospital with kids, you know, as young as about eight and they found it really fun and also really effective. So there's not an evidence base for it yet, but um, it, it seems to be benign um, and helpful.